way, our faith, our faith is us coming back again and again and again to the things of Jesus. It's us coming back again and again and again to the presence of God and entering into this space. See, a lot of times the movement that we want to have, the, the, the direction, if we want to live intentionally, it's about us. We, we want it to be as fast process. We move from point A to point B, right? We have a lot of, we talked about this last week. We kind of are this self-help culture, right? We want to move from point A to point B. Here's all the steps, bing, 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 and we move on. But a lot of times the movement that we have is us moving so that we can be present. It's not as much about all the steps and the things we know, but it's about the ways that we're able to be present, and we move, and we're present, and we move, and we're present. And so we're going to kind of go through a couple different things uh, this week, and slides are getting a little ahead of me, but that's okay. Um, we're going to be moving through a few steps this week to kind of look at some practical ways we can move, but we're also going to be looking at some kind of relational uh, ways that we live life. It's not going to be this cut and dry, like here's all the things you have to do to be a follower of Jesus and to live intentionally. But here's some ways that we can move through this. And before I get into them, I just wanted to suggest a few things for you. If you're uh, kind of a person who likes to read or likes to think, um, there's some really good resources that you can have on all this. We're just going to kind of skim through some thoughts, some practices in, in church culture throughout history, and, and we're going to skim through what it looks like to live relationally together, um, but we're not going to go super in-depth, and if you're interested in that, I'd suggest, uh, uh, if you really like reading uh, and you're intellectual or whatever, uh, this book, The Spirit of the Disciplines by Dallas Willard is a really good book about not just what spiritual disciplines are or spiritual practices, but um, it's a really in-depth book about why they're important and why God can use them to shape our lives. But if you're not as intellectual and you don't want like a hard read or something heavy, um, I mentioned this book last week, but um, John Mark Comer's The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry is a really good resource for you. Just to, it kind of, it mirrors some of the series that we've gone through about what it means to be with Jesus, be like Jesus, do as he did, slowing down our lives, that kind of stuff. So those are just some resources. There's plenty out there, and I'm just kind of going to move through some different aspects of this. But to start, kind of this movement, this going in the ways of Jesus, living out the lifestyle of Jesus. The first week when we met, we talked about how we need to return to the presence of God. We need to come back into his presence, that he is inviting us in. He says, come and see, come follow me. And then last week we said, if we want to remember, the, if we want to live intentionally in our lives, we need to continue in the way of Jesus. We need to be with Jesus again and again. And so this week, surprise, we're coming back again to the presence of God. It is that important that we are continually going back to the presence of God. And so as we're moving intentionally, Intentionally, it starts with this intentional internal movement. That the inner workings of our lives are things that we go to to allow God to shape us. And so I'm kind of calling this internal movement our habits of growth. We talked a little bit about this last week. Here are some habits that you can have, some practices, some spiritual disciplines, if you want to call it that, of ways that we can grow and move intentionally in our faith. And the first of these, it, it might sound a little weird or a little not as much like a habit, but it's just this act of slowing down. It's this act of slowing the way that we move through life. We're in a very busy culture. We're in a very busy world. And if we're going to meet God and we're going to meet others, we need to slow our pace. We need to slow things down. Jesus, when he lived on this earth... He was in this process of meeting with people constantly over and over and over again. But when he met with people, 
He didn't just like stay with people all the time, but he would retreat and he would go off. There's, an, there's instances all throughout the scriptures of this happening where Jesus was around people and he was healing and he was teaching and then he would go off to meet with the Father, to go off to be in the presence of God. One of these instances is in Luke 5, verse 15. It was talking about Jesus, he just healed a man with leprosy, and it says, Yet the news about him spread all the more, so that the crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. So we have Jesus, he just healed a man of leprosy, news got out that he healed this man, and so everyone's like, we need to go to Jesus, we need to find Jesus, and Jesus was like, you know what, I'm going to withdraw and I'm going to go to these lonely places. Um, in the scriptures, it, it, it describes them as desolate places, lonely places, desert places. It's basically people where there were, places where there were no people. He went off to find time to be with God, and this required him to slow down. I wonder what that looks like for you. I, I know a lot of us don't really want to slow down, or maybe we don't know how to slow down. You know, slowing down, it could be this simple thing of, of not rolling through stop signs, right? You know, I don't know if any of you are guilty of that. Or maybe you sit at a stop sign for five seconds before you move through it and teach the person behind you to slow down too. I don't know, but it could be that. It could be this process of that. You Maybe you just drive the speed limit. Maybe you go to the longest line at the grocery store and you learn to slow down. Maybe you just talk slower. I don't know what it is, but it's this process of slowing our rhythms and our pace and getting to this place where we can seek God in the moments that are at hand and sometimes retreating to these places of solitude, stillness, and Sabbath rest where we can go off in the silence and we can meet God. But it's not just there to just sit there and sit with ourselves, because I know some of you dread that more than anything. I've been with teenagers, and I've done moments where we just did like five minutes of silence, and you know, they, they were freaking out by the end of that. We, we were afraid to sit in the silence by ourselves. Jesus didn't just go to sit there and do nothing. He went there, and he began to, to live out these habits that we can learn from. And the first of these, it might sound obvious, um, but he prayed. When he went to these places, he often was there praying. He would slow down, he would retreat into these places of solitude, and he would pray. He would pray there in those spaces and meet God. It's really interesting because um, we've been talking about Jesus' the two greatest commandments we talked about last week. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The first of those is actually a prayer. I don't know if you know that. Uh, the Shema. It's a, a Jewish prayer from the book of Deuteronomy. And it was a prayer practice that they would have every day, two to three times a day. They would go and they would pray the Shema, that they would love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. So not only is he going away to these solitude places, but I wonder if Jesus prayed the Shema while he was there. If Jesus was in this place where he was reflecting on loving God and, and, and this process of teaching us, hey, when you go off, hey, go off and pray that you would love God better. Go off and meet God and pray that you would love him better. Go off and build up these habits over and over and over again. But Jesus didn't just pray. There's a few other things that he did as well. And one of those is fasting. He fasted. Um, we see this throughout Scripture in various different scenarios, different people, Elijah, Moses, Jesus fasted for really long periods of time. There's other shorter fasts that happen throughout the Scripture. And we're not really going to get into why we fast and what fasting is, beside the fact that it's us going, like not having food, for a time, a period of time, so that we could focus on God. One of the biggest moments of this is when Jesus, right after he was baptized in Luke 4, he's baptized right before this, and then it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan, and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them was very hungry. I, I find it very interesting that at the end, he, he fasted for 40 days. It says that he was hungry. 
And we might think, oh, obviously he was hungry. But the interesting thing about that is that it's pointing out Jesus' humanity. Here he is practicing these things, and in his humanity he is hungry, but he has been seeking God, and he has been growing in strength spiritually because he has been connecting with God. Think about it. He's been tempted this whole time, and he's been able to sustain that through the, this connection, through his relationship with God in those moments. When we go, uh, we can go off into solitude, and we can fast, and we can pray, and we can seek God. But another common way that we can do this, that a lot of us do already, is just studying the scriptures, meditating on the scriptures, and learning the things of God. We can sit down again and again and again with the teachings of Jesus. Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy burdened. We talked about that last week. Take my yoke upon you. And we talked about how this is a idiom for a, uh, the teachings of a rabbi. So we're taking Jesus' yoke upon us and we are learning from him again and again and again. And maybe all this sounds really obvious and you're like, yeah, I didn't come here to learn that I need to pray and I need to read my Bible and I need to fast. But the interesting thing about these things is when we do them, when we live out spiritual practices and principles, when we, we move in this way, we get to this place where our lives begin to slow down and we begin to simplify the way that we're living. We begin to move the internal spaces around within us so that we're simplifying our hearts and our motives and the things going on. And so I kind of put this on here as a way that we can grow as people. How often do we need to simplify the way that we're living so that we can meet with God? You see, praying and reading the Bible and fasting, they're not in ends in and of themselves. So often when I have teenagers at youth group and I say, hey, like, how's your relationship with God? They'll tell me, oh, I went to church, I prayed tonight, I read my Bible. And they think that that's the goal. The goal is not to just be at church and just pray and just read your Bible or to fast. The goal is to be able to enter the presence of God, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, as God would love them. There are a way that we can grow in our relationship with God. I think that's really important. And so as we look at this, we see that as we slow down and we pray and we fast and we study, we begin to simplify our lives. And I wonder what that looks like for you. We ha are in a culture with a lot of things, a lot of stuff, a lot of possessions, streaming services, social media accounts, ambitions, achievements, goals. What would it look like for you to simplify any one of those? To cancel some streaming services, to delete some social media accounts, maybe to not pursue the career that you want to pursue because where you're at, you're able to meet God and meet others more fully. I don't know what that looks like for you. But we need to start in these internal spaces of our lives and move toward God. And this sets us up to continue to walk with Jesus toward other people. I think a lot of times our mistake is that we want to say, okay, I'm done with my God time, now I have my people time. But we're moving with God into relationship with other people, and we're entering this space of external movements. We're entering this space um, that I'm just calling the habits of engagement. And this is not, I'm not going to be pulling out like spiritual practices and disciplines here, but I want us to look at what does it look like for us to engage people fully in relationship. So often, I believe, as Christians, we get to this place where we want to engage people not as a whole, but as one part. So we say, hey, I'm going to engage people spiritually. I'm going to go down the street, I'm going to meet with someone, I'm going to ask them, where you, if you died today, where are you going to go? I'm going to find someone, and I'm going to say, hey, what's going on? You know, do you know Jesus? And that's not bad. It's not bad for us to connect with people spiritually, but when it's the only part that we connect with people, it can be a problem. Because all they see is us with an agenda trying to sway them in one direction or the other when we should be meeting people as Jesus met with people and taught us to engage with people. And so how did Jesus do it? Well, first, 
He taught us we need to engage people. We need to be there physically with people. We need to seek people out and be there face to face with people. Jesus, throughout his ministry, he was with people all the time. He was always hanging out with people. Um, And they weren't always the people that you think he should be hanging out with. It's interesting because he would go and he would just spend time there with them and connect with them. In one instance, in Mark 2, 13, Jesus, um, I'll just read it, Mark 2, 13. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi sitting by at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. We have Jesus entering the space of another person, of a handful of people, and engaging with them. He found Levi, who's a tax collector. He said, come follow me. Then he went to Levi's house, and he ate at Levi's table with Levi's friends, who were sinners and tax collectors, people who were hated in this culture. He went and he met with them physically in their space. He was welcomed by them, and he entered into their presence. And I think it's really interesting that Jesus is constantly eating with people. Especially in that culture, eating was this big deal. The people you ate with were the people you were willing to associate with. The people that you ate with were the people that you were willing to connect with. And so Jesus would go and he would eat with whoever welcomed him in, whether it's the sinners and the tax collectors or the Pharisee who invites him to a meal later on in in the Gospels. He connected with them. He sat down with them. Who do you sit down with to eat? Is it only people from church? Is it only your friends and your family? Is there someone out there who you could be sitting down with and having a meal with? Because when we do that, we enter this kind of dual space, and we'll just go to the next two here. We meet people physically, and when we're there physically with them, we meet them relationally. We connect with them life on life, and we also enter this space where we can connect with them emotionally as well, where we can engage with them, we can go deeper with them, we can be vulnerable with them, we can share how we're feeling, they can share how they're feeling, and we can connect with them on this deeper level. And that's really important. Jesus called us to love people. Loving people isn't just throwing a gospel tract at them, but it's talking with them, it's conversing with them, it's building relationships with them, it's meeting them and empathizing with them and being vulnerable with them. But we, a lot of us on the other end of the spectrum might just stop there. We might say, okay, I'll go meet with people and we'll hang out and we'll have some emotional moments and that's it. But when Jesus coached his disciples on how to live this out, in Luke 10, he taught them that they would go, okay, so they would go and they would seek people. And you could read this whole passage um, when you go home or on your own time, but I'll just kind of take you through some of the pieces here. He would say, he said to them, go and stay where you're going. I'm about to go to these towns all around. I want you to go out and stay there. Eat whatever is given you. So again, there's this act of eating, of sitting down with someone and eating. When you enter a town and are welcome, eat what is offered you. Heal the sick who are there, and then tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. So there's this act of going. You're going and seeking people. You're staying with people. Um, They would stay in this one house in a town, and that would be their headquarters to kind of branch out and connect. And they would eat meals with people. They'd build relationships with people. They would meet their physical needs and help them out. And then 
Then they would tell them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. There's this holistic approach to meeting people where they are at, physically, relationally, emotionally, and spiritually. As we are called into loving people, how do we meet them on all spectrums? And this, it, this goes both ways. So this isn't just people outside the church, but it's also people within the church. So we should be connecting with people outside of this gathering. Outside of this space, we should be connecting with people who aren't in the church building. And we should be connecting with each other here. We see this in kind of the Great Commission, um, kind of scoped out for us. The first two parts of the Great Commission, go and make disciples, are about that first part. You're going, you're seeking people out, and you're, t you're telling them about Jesus. You're making disciples. That's the process of introducing people to Jesus, sharing Jesus with them, and seeing if they're going to respond or not. So it's that first section, you go in Matthew 28, you go and make disciples. And then when they say, if they say, hey, I'm going to follow Jesus, then you baptize them into the way of Jesus. You say, hey, you're, you're now a part of the church. This is your outward confession of your faith. And now I'm going to teach you the ways of Jesus, teach you to obey all that I have commanded you. So we see this example not just outside the church, but also in the church. Acts 2 is a great example of this, where they're meeting daily, they're having meals together, they're going to the temple, they're learning about Jesus and living his teachings. But what does this look like for us? How do we move in these areas where we are seeking God and we're seeking others, where we're loving God with all our hearts, and we're loving our neighbor as ourself. How do we do that, despite the circumstances? Because so often our circumstances will hurl us towards the presence of God sometimes, and it will hurl us towards loving our neighbor, and it will feel easy or maybe necessary. But life often isn't like that on a day-to-day -day level. So how do we do that? I was given an opportunity last summer, um, we went on a missions trip to Kentucky. When we went to Kentucky, our circumstances were thrust upon us. So if you don't know what happened in Kentucky last summer, there was massive flooding, and we were set to go on this trip since 2020, and it just happened to fall at the end of July last summer. During our training, we found that everything was shifted because of our circumstances. And so we were not only set up to seek God in all the ways that I kind of mentioned here where we had moments of solitude, we had moments of prayer, we had moments where we could, we could just study his scriptures and be, but we were forced into these really raw, emotional, relational, physical moments that led to spiritual conversations, and it was really cool. It was this really great opportunity, but it was all curated for us. It was all set before us, set in motion by the circumstances, by this trip that was planned, by the natural disaster that was at hand, and then we came home. And I thought, okay, that was great. That was really cool. I hope these kids learn something from this. I hope that we learn something from this. But so often in our lives, we'll move on from moments like that, well, six months later, we're planning our coffee house here at Cornerstone. Some of you might have been there, I don't know, but we sat down, I sat down with the teenagers, a, majority, a handful of them had been on this trip, and I asked them, I said, what do you want this event to be about? And their answer kind of surprised me, because it's teenagers, and they said, we want to have a coffee house where we don't have our cell phones. Um, where there's no phones, we're just relationally connecting with one another and just being present. And I was like, well, that's weird. Okay, that's cool. Like, I'm all for that. But why? And they're like, well, we want it to be like that coffee house we went to in Lynch, Kentucky. And I was like, okay, like... I, I went to that coffee house and the coffee was okay, you know, like whatever. And I couldn't find a table when I was there, so I don't really understand. But okay, like you want to have like this time to connect, that's good. 
Then on my ride home that night, it clicked, or maybe it clicked, I don't know, the teenagers can tell me I'm wrong probably, but uh, they had been on this trip. They didn't have their phones with them the entire time. They had these moments of connecting with people like never before. And on that last Friday of our trip, we had an opportunity to serve again, but we were emotionally exhausted, physically exhausted. I said, no, we can't do that. Um, and we had this time where we bonded as a group. And when we went to that coffee house, it was kind of like us reflecting on our week without any distractions, connecting intentionally with one another, sitting down at a table with nothing in the way, and we were able to meet each other physically, emotionally, spiritually, and relationally. And they wanted to carry that on. They wanted to carry that forth from Kentucky to here. And so we had our coffee house and there was no cell phones. And it was a time for us to just sit and reflect and play games and connect with each other. That was one way they did it. How can we move in that way? Where we take the circumstances that we are given and the way that God moves us and we carry that forth into our lives. Who can we sit down with at the table? If you notice, I have a table up here, right? And someone asked me why I have two chairs. Yeah, I don't know if you noticed. <laughs> um, two chairs because, first of all, I wanted one to sit on, which I didn't do, but um, when we sit down with people at a table, there's always another chair. When you connect with someone else, you don't just say, you don't say, hey, come over to my house, I got one seat. You know, let's, uh, you know, you can stand, uh, sit down, all right? You know, we'll, we'll, you, you can eat standing up, I'll give you a fork, that's cool. You know, like, we don't do that, we have an open seat. So we sit down, the other person comes, they sit at the table with us, and we meet people there. How in your life can you begin to meet people in these kind of spaces? How can you sit down with people and show them the love of God? There's two ways, I just wanna throw this out, I know I've gone long probably, but one is there's an opportunity coming up in July. If any of you are interested, our teenagers are doing this. Um, not at a table, but in a park. Um, we're going to Chestnut Hill Park on July 22nd in the morning from 10 to, to noon. And we're just, we rented out the big field and we're just gonna meet with people. We're gonna hang out with people. We have a lawn game set up and we're gonna have free snacks and free drinks for the community. And we're just gonna meet people where they're at. We're gonna bless the community. If you wanna help, if you wanna be a part of that, you're welcome to join us, talk to me afterward. But the way I want to challenge you in this all the more is to just start where you're at. Who can you invite over to your house to sit down at the table with you? Who can you invite over to connect with, whether it's at your house or somewhere for coffee or whatever, who can you connect with relationally? Because God desires that we would walk in the way of Jesus. The very first week that I did, started this series, we, we started with a message about the fact that we are God's workmanship. I don't know if you remember, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he has prepared in advance for us to do. That he has made us these living works of art, these living poems to intersect with the lives of others that he has set up these moments for us to move in. And so as a way to kind of remember that and to reflect on this series and these thoughts, um, when you guys leave, there's gonna be these little canvases out in the lobby. Um, this is for you to remember that you are God's work of art. You're this living work of art for the purpose of following the ways of Jesus and living out the ways of Jesus. And you can do whatever you want with this. Like you can just keep it as a reminder, blank. You can paint on it if you want. Maybe write the names of the people that you wanna sit down and have a meal with on here or whatever. But it's just a reminder to us that there are opportunities every day to live intentionally here and now 
to love God and to love others. So let's move into those spaces with God at our side. Let me pray for us. Dear Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity we have to connect. I pray that you would teach us how to live in these spaces all the more and that you would show us how we can love you and how we can love others fully and intentionally. And we thank you and pray this all in your name.